Welcome, and thank you so much for joining me on this sojourn into the world of the Theorbo, and more specifically, uh, into the world of French Theorbo music. Now, before we head off to France, I thought we should take a trip to Italy and discuss the origins of this, this instrument. This instrument was invented in the 1580s by Florentine humanists who were at the Bardi court. Um, it uh, is sometimes credited to Alessandro Nardi as being the inventor of this instrument. Um, this instrument was uh, called the Tiorba, the, the Italian word for it, and the term that we use today, the theorbo, is the anglicized version of that. Um, at the first half of the 17th century, it was also referred to as a chitarrone, uh, which comes from the Greek uh, word for chitara, which is just an instrument that the Greeks um, used in to accompany uh, a voice or recitation. And um, they, 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 the Florentine humanists took the term chitara and added the suffix one onto it, uh, which means to make something bigger, and came up with the word chitarone, meaning a big chitara. Um, now this term falls out of use uh, in the second half of the 17th century, and, and really we just see the term theorbo or theorba used to describe this instrument. Um, the, uh, the reason for sort of creating this instrument was the uh, Florentine humanist fascination with the antiquities and ancient Greek uh, and ancient um, uh, the ancient Greek practice of um, recitation to a musical accompaniment and the Greeks described the power of music and how music has the ability to move the emotions and passions um, of sort of a, um, a sort of otherworldly effect that music has. Um, and the, um, the Florentine humanists at the time were looking to sort of recreate something uh, like that in their own, in their own way. Um, and so what they did is they started to take existing instruments, uh, and particularly the lute, and they took bass lutes, so basically an instrument with a similar pear-shaped body like this, a big body. The peg box would have gone this way, like a lute. And what they did is they started to experiment uh, with restringing the instrument. So what they did is they started to string the instrument higher to sort of create a stronger, brighter sound to the instrument. Um, what ended up happening when they did that is that the top strings, because this, the, the strings would have needed to have been so thin, um, to produce such a high pitch that they uh, broke. And so what they started to do was to replace those strings with uh, a thicker string that would have been tuned down an octave. And that sort of led to one of the one unique characteristics of this instrument, which is the re-entrant tuning, which basically means that as you go up the uh, strings on the instrument, you come to this being the highest, and the top two are down an octave. So the, the tuning sort of re-enters, it goes back down. Um, and that's a sort of unique characteristic of this instrument. Um, another um, characteristic of this instrument is the, are the long bass strings. And uh, that were sort of, those were sort of put on to sort of add a, um, a nice solid uh, foundation for accompanying. Um, and one of the um, uh, defining features of this instrument is the long neck. And Alessandro Piccinini, the Bolognese uh, lutenist, uh, in his preface uh, discusses in detail how this uh, neck extension came to be. But essentially the reason why they added on a neck extension like this was that at the time, uh, string technology uh, was not quite as developed as it is today. And um, in order to sort of create a lower pitch string, they had to add more density to a string. And, and strings at that time period were uh, made of gut, and so to increase the density, you would just have to add more gut to the string. Um, and of course, that creates the, that makes the string thicker uh, when, it, when that happens. And if you have a shorter string length and you keep adding gut to it, you come up with eventually a, a string that's quite thick and doesn't vibrate very well. So in order to sort of 
get around that problem, they created a long neck extension so they could have thinner bass strings um, like this, and that's why you have it. Now, later on in the, in the 1660s, 1670s, they came up with the idea of wound strings. So they would take a piece of gut, and in a, as opposed to just adding more gut to increase the density, they would wrap a piece of metal, so they wind it with metal around it, and that would increase the density quite a bit more, and we wouldn't need such a thick string. But at the time, in 1580s, they didn't have wound strings, and so their solution was to have a big uh, neck extension. Um, the result of this was a wonderful an instrument that was wonderfully suited for accompaniment. It had, with the reentrant tuning and the sort of higher pitched uh, strings, it had a very kind of bright, strong sound. Uh, it didn't have a lot of high notes on it. It had a very sort of thick middle range because of the reentrant tuning. And then the long basses provided a really, really wonderful bass register and foundation for accompaniment. Um, and, uh, and this instrument was really, really um, uh, highly valued as an accompaniment instrument, particularly uh, at the beginning of the 17th century. Um, now the Theorbo spread widely outside of Italy, and in France, they sort of developed their own style of Theorbo. Um, they still had sort of larger uh, Theorbos that were um, used for operas and ballets and things of that nature, chamber music. Um, but they also had, and they also developed a smaller size instrument, which would have been similar to this. Um, and that was an instrument particularly used for solo playing. Um, and, um, and although, like I said, there, that this instrument was uh, used mainly for, uh, a, as an accompaniment instrument, there are some really, really uh, wonderful examples of existing solo music for the Theorbo. The first set of pieces I'd like to play for you are by the composer Charles Harrell. And we know very little about the life of Harrell. Um, we know that he was active in Paris, the second half of the 17th century. He was um, a musician and an eminent professor, and he was from a prosperous um, Parisian family of luthiers. So they, were, uh, uh, they made instruments in Paris in the 17th century. Um, in 1684, he was uh, noted in a Parisian document as an ordinary officer of the Academy of Music and as a professor of Theorbo. Um, I'd like to play uh, three pieces by uh, Harel from his publication of Suites for Theorbo. And, um, the uh, suite was probably one of the most important musical forms during the Baroque era. Um, it was basically a collection of dances, and uh, it was usually um, uh, started with a, um, a prelude or an overture, and followed by an allemand, courant, sarabande, a jig, a gavotte. It could be a, a number of dances. It could be. Um, included in them. And, uh, and in particular, the suite was um, uh, very popular in France. Uh, Fran uh, the, the French were very um, uh, interested in uh, dance music, in particular ballet, um, was sort of a French, um, uh, sort of a national um, treasure was the French ballet and, and dance and dance music. So the suite was a very important part of um, all musical, um, things musical in France. Um, the three pieces I've chosen to play by Harel um, are sort of the, the kind of core of the suite, if you will. Um, uh, most of the examples of suites that you'll see around include these three dances, which are typically the first three, and they would be a prelude followed by an allemande and a courant. And uh, the prelude in this uh, instance is what's called an unmeasured prelude which was a very sort of distinct uh, uh, type of prelude. Um, it, what it meant, an unmeasured prelude, is it doesn't have bar lines or measures. Um, and so unlike a, a normal piece of music, let's say that it's in uh, grouped into groupings of four, you have a bar line every four beats. In an unmeasured prelude, you might have just a few bar lines in the entire piece. So you'll have uh, long, long stretches of music that are not sort of organized into to specific groups. Um, another thing that this unmeasured prelude had that was sort of 
uh, different than other types of preludes um, is that it had very few note values in it. So it would not give you lots of indications about um, if and how long a note should be. And what these two things did is they, um, they allowed the performer lots of um, interpretive freedom. And the result of this was that the pieces uh, had a sort of highly improvisatory feel. So that's the first piece I'll play is an unmeasured prelude. And the next piece is an alamon, which is a sort of more stately, slower uh, German dance in two. And that'll be followed by a courant. And uh, the word courant literally means running. So this is a, obviously a, a quicker uh, piece. And uh, courants are in triple meter. So here is the prelude, allemande, and courant by Charles Harrell from his suite in G major. Thank you. 
The next piece I'd like to play is by the composer Nicolas Hotman. And Hotman was actually not um, French. He was most likely from Brussels or possibly Germany, but he moved with his family when he was a teenager to Paris and he spent his entire life in France. And his music for all intents and purposes today is thought of as French music. Um, I, uh, I thought I would uh, do a selection of his music since that he's an example of foreigners who came to Paris or to Versailles uh, from abroad and although they were not French had a um, significant impact on French music. Um, and the most notable uh, musician uh, who fits this in France is uh, the, the um, composer Lully who was um, sort of the champion of opera and ballet uh, for Louis XIV at the court in Versailles. And Lully, um, although he sort of is thought of as the father of uh, Baroque French music, he was actually um, born in Italy and actually Italian. Um, Hotman was um, a, uh, a, known as an expert lutenist, theorbist, and also viola da gamba player. Um, he also is sometimes uh, referred to as the teacher of Saint Colomb, who was one of the great viola da gamba players um, in the early Baroque. Um, I'm going to play a Passacaglia, um, and a Passacaglia was a 16th century Spanish dance, and passar means to walk in Spanish. Um, and basically, a Passacaglia is a repeating chord progression, so you have uh, this sort of um, report, chord progression that repeats over and over again, and there's a series of sort of variations on the um, chord progression, the Pasakaya. So here is the Pasakaya by Nicholas Hotman. Thank you. 
The last two selections I'd like to play for you are by the composer Robert de Vizet. De Vizet was a theorbist, lutenist, guitarist, viola de gambist, and singer who was appointed to be a court musician at the court in Versailles for Louis XIV in 1680. And there he played chamber music uh, for the court as well as played an, the orchestra for Lully, played in the ballets and operas. Uh, later on in his tenure at uh, the court, he was appointed as the guitar teacher to the king. So he was Louis XIV's private guitar teacher as well. Um, he published a, a, a few Baroque guitar books. He also published um, some music for Theorbo and the lute as well. Um, the two pieces I'd like to play for you now uh, are a prelude, another unmeasured prelude from one of his suites, uh, followed by a chacon. And a chacon is another Spanish dance similar to the Pasacalia. Uh, it sort of uh, has a short um, harmonic progression that repeats over and over again. And that harmonic progression is a vehicle for variations on it. Um, one last thing I'd like to say about De Vizet is that he, uh, in some of the court records, it shows that De Vizet was summoned to play uh, at Louis XIV's bedside. And so, um, although we don't have a lot of insight into what it's like to uh, the sort of daily life of Louis XIV might have been like, um, this gives us a little insight into the kind of uh, bedtime music that Louis XIV enjoyed. So thank you so much for joining me on this journey and I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have.
Thank you.